Well, this is a 1946 J3 Cub. It's got a 75 horse engine on it and it's completely stock. Hasn't had anything done to it at all. So when I go up there and do what I do, it's, uh, it's done with the utmost care because the airplane isn't made to do heavy aerobatics. Let's talk about that. Tell us exactly. Let's talk me through what you actually do when you get out there. You, you climb up to a certain altitude. Talk me through it. Yeah, it uh, primarily starts off with climbing up the altitude. I go up to 4,000 feet, and that's what takes more time during the act than anything else. I have to uh, take off, climb. It's about, oh, probably about uh, 12 minutes to get up to altitude. And then once I get up uh, to altitude, uh, I just make sure everything's secure one last time, make sure the doors are all buttoned up and uh, get myself uh, spotted over, over top of the field, shut the engine off, just turn off the magneto switch. And uh, once the propeller stops turning, I start diving, which takes about 500 feet to get up to uh, the airspeed to do maneuvering, which is about 120 miles an hour. And I start off by doing a, just a standard Cuban 8, uh, which is rather interesting doing it in an airplane like this because you really can't push any negative on it, so you have to start rolling it before you actually get out of the top of the loop. And then uh, after doing the Cuban 8, uh, I usually follow up with, a, with some sort of uh, turnaround maneuver, uh, usually a reverse Cuban 8, and then come back, do a loop, turn around again, give them one roll, try and make a pass, just so it's down low enough and close enough where the people can hear as well as see that the engine is not running. And from what I've been told, the uh, airplane makes uh, rather unique sounds, sounds like a jet as it goes by because of the uh, air that's flowing over the airplane, the wind noise. I don't get that same noise inside the cockpit. It's, uh, it's a lot, just a lot of rattling. It sounds like just a, a wave, constant wave of the ocean coming over inside the cockpit. But uh, I usually get down to about 500 feet, which is my, my altitude uh, that I have set as my, my reference point for turning in. I have certain places on the field mentally marked in my brain where I want to be at this altitude, at this airspeed, before I touch down. I know how far I'm going to roll, and usually come in just a little hot. You have to depend on your brakes, and it uh, ends up stopping where you want to stop. And it doesn't seem like it's all that exciting or thrilling for my end of it, uh, but for, apparently to the crowd, I get a very good response, and uh, they seem to appreciate it. I, I, I actually, you know, it's nothing that I invented. It's something that uh, I picked up from Bob Hoover and Dwayne Cole, some of my heroes from years ago. They used to do an energy management routine, and that's really what I'm doing, is, is what they were doing, is just exchanging altitude for energy so I can do the maneuver and uh, show people that, you know, it doesn't matter if the engine's running or not, you can still fly the airplane and set it down safely. Can you start this aeroplane when it's up there, once it's stopped? Can I start the airplane again once it's stopped? Well, the answer is yes and no. During the act, if I dive the airplane fast enough, anything beyond 120 miles an hour indicated, the propeller will start to tick over. And as it ticks over, I can turn, make sure the fuel's on and turn the switch on and it'll start running just like you engage the starter. But to dive the airplane to 120 miles an hour, I have to exchange a lot of altitude to get that airspeed. So at a certain point during my routine, which is about 2,000 feet, once I get down to 2,000 feet, I really don't have enough altitude to safely get the engine started again because if I dive the airplane from 2,000 feet, by the time I get to 120 miles an hour, I'm below my 500 foot altitude that I need to land. So. You know, one, once I get below 2,000 feet, I'm committed. Now, for the viewers that are watching this, and you have to repeat my question because I'm not on it, <laughs> um, we have to make it very clear that you cannot, there's no starter on this. You have to prop this baby to fire it up, right? No, there is absolutely no starter on this airplane whatsoever. It's either you start it on the ground by hand, where somebody actually gets in front of it and pulls the propeller through fast enough to where the engine engages, or you have to get it going fast enough for where the wind. This airplane is a PT-17 Stearman. Uh, it was used by the Army Air Corps from 1941 through 1945 as a trainer. Uh, they use these to train the primary instruction for pilots uh, along with the PT-19 and several other 
uh, trainer aircraft. How did you get into flying? Well, I came out to the flying circus. No, I got when I, oh, I got into flying. Oh, okay, yeah. All right, I'm sorry. Um, how I got into flying, I came out to the flying circus when I was 14 years old, and I bought a ride and a Stearman just like the one that I own now, and it hooked me on the, on the aviation experience of flying old biplanes, and so I decided I wanted to be a pilot, and I worked on getting my private pilot's license on my own, and uh, eventually became a pilot. You come out to the circus every Sunday, or as many times as you possibly can. Tell, tell me about that. Well, I've, been, I've come out to the circus since uh, about 1975. I started working out here as a ground crew. And uh, except for a short stint when I was in the Air Force and I was out of the, uh, didn't live in Virginia, I have been coming out here almost every Sunday. I don't like to miss a show because I feel like I really get cheated if I miss a show because uh, it's so much fun. And we only get to fly six months out of the year out here. So uh, it's real important for me. I, I just like being out here every Sunday and being part of the team. What's the biggest thrill you have when you come to the circus every Sunday? What is the, the biggest, in these words, the biggest kick I get okay. is? Okay. The biggest kick I get out of the circus is flying the air show. I really enjoy flying formation and, and flying with the other, uh, the other aircraft uh, and performing the show and also taking people for rides in the airplane so that they can experience uh, these flying in these old biplanes and it's really enjoy I really enjoy seeing people uh, have a good time when they do that and that's my challenge to so always make sure everybody I take up really enjoys it has a great time thank you okay Stan I want just tell me how you started what, why you got into this John and I know you were part of that when you talk through all that and why you do this at the circus well I was one of the uh, kids that grew up with their dad as a pilot and so from a, the earliest I can remember, I wanted to be a pilot. Um, and we had this experience back in the 1970s when the Flying Circus was begun. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't the original group, but uh, about the second year we got involved with it and uh, found that this was our niche as far as aviation was concerned. Of course, with the old airplanes, it reminded us of the fact that we wished we had been born about 20 years earlier to be able to fly these things when they were a whole lot newer. And, and that, that sense of aviation, this golden age of aviation that we uh, recreate out here at the Flying Circus is really the most pleasurable flying to us there is. And you, it, it's also a living history, isn't it? I mean, talk to me about this. I mean, it is a living history. We consider what we do out here basically a living history of aviation. Uh, when we started, or the time that we've been here, it's interesting to remind ourselves that we've been flying for a third of the time that man's been flying. Uh, a couple of years ago, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of flight. Well, even at that point, we've been flying for 30 years. So uh, to, be, to be an aviation flying museum and exist for that long is really quite extraordinary. Now, the unique part about this too, as, well, as everyone said, is you, you get a thrill I mean, you, of getting all this act together. It's a very enjoyable act, a lot of fun, but you, people that are actually then get to fly in these biplanes. Not only do we de demonstrate what the old barnstormers did, but part of what the barnstormers did was do an air show with the purpose of giving rise to the people. Now, they were probably a little bit more mercenary than we are. Uh, we get a lot of our satisfaction from giving the ride to the folks. Uh, the smiles on their faces, the, uh, the youngsters now over 30 years that come back and got their first ride here at the Flying Circus and uh, now they're in the military. They're a military pilot, they're a commercial airline pilot, they're a civilian pilot, but their first recollection of an airplane ride was here and uh, you can't put a price on that. So we make enough money to pay for the airplanes. I don't know of anybody out here that's making a whole lot of money, um, but we we, we can keep the airplanes, we can keep them flying, we can maintain them, and again, we share them with the public, and to us, that's extremely satisfying. We do remind the folks that uh, would like to remind them that this is a nonprofit organization. The Flying Circus Foundation is nonprofit. Uh, we do our best to use the money wisely, and it's through the spectators that come out, we gain the money to continue on, to build the facilities that make this a first class operation, and maintain the airplanes and keep them available throughout. Uh, the future as long as we can foresee it.